it's more or less you leave your job to Claire. <laughs> and uh, we send Claire robots to give us uh, more information <laughs> about how you should and the contextual in China. So thank you, Claire. Thank you. Hello everyone, it's nice to, nice to be here. Um, I would firstly like to um, express my sincere thanks to P-League um, and the m team for um, inviting uh, me. It's a great honor to be here and to participate in one of the talks um, that are taking place to discuss Chinese art and visual culture in the context of the m um, collection. Um, it's also a great pleasure to be part of the conversation relating to the republication of Liu, um, Liu Hongxing's uh, 1983 landmark uh, photo book, um, a book that anyone um, interested in China knows and loves. And it's great that a full set of the photographs um, have been acquired by M+. Uh, the subtitle of Liu's book, uh, Seeking Truth from Facts, underlines for us the uh, historical specificity of Liu's project and his sense of mission um, in putting together the volume. Liu has described himself um, as a traditional photojournalist uh, and observed that he was lucky to spend five years what he termed observing China, first in Guangzhou, as we heard in 1976, after the death of Mao Zedong, and three years later when he was posted to Beijing uh, with Time magazine. He took full advantage, um, he says, of the latitude that was provided to him by his employer to report on whatever he thought was interesting. As a Hong Kong-born, China-schooled, American-educated photojournalist, Liu Hongxing, a naturalized American and longtime resident in Beijing, is a complex transcultural package. In a recent interview, Liu was asked how he felt uh, about being described by the Beijing-based uh, artist and cultural critic Chen Danqing as the only outsider, along with Katia Bresson, to produce true or accurate images of China. Liu responded by distancing himself from the perspective of Katia Bresson and other non-Chinese photographers and disagreeing that he was an outsider. My work, he said, is closer to ordinary Chinese people. Chen's backhanded compliment raises a number of interesting and important questions regarding the definitions of Chinese photography um, and the ongoing reluctance uh, within mainland China to view photojournalism or photography more broadly uh, by so-called outsiders, people working for outside agencies uh, within a Chinese cultural context. So the acquisition of Liu's photographs by M Plus is an important challenge to the problem of these outsider-insider, these problematic outsider-insider um, categories. I've often asked, asked myself, uh, why are Liu's images among the most memorable um, of those taken at the time when China was just beginning to open up again to the outside world? Is it because of his background as both, in my view, an outsider um, and as an empathetic insider and what he terms his own contextual understanding? Or is it more about the viewer and their experience and understanding? In this case, me. I was an art student in Beijing in the late 1970s and early 80s. In, um, um, and is it that I appreciate not only the subject matter drawn from daily life, but also a familiar cosmopolitan aesthetic that he developed during his training in the USA? In this short talk, I want to focus our attention on seeing China through the lens of Liu Hongxing. And I want to compare a small number of his photographs with works by contemporaneous uh, Beijing photographers, all of them well known to Liu, um, as a means to better apprehend his particular style um, of photojournalism. But before we do that, I want to uh, start by making a couple of general observations um, about documentary photography 
and also pose some questions. And by documentary photography, I mean the use of photography to candidly and objectively record aspects of daily life with a view to contributing to the historic record um, and a genre, a genre of photography that encompasses photojournalism, uh, but also the work of independent practitioners. From our perspective today in the 21st century, it's easy for us to forget just how precious late 20th century documentary photography is in China. Chen Xiaobo, for example, reminds us of the terrible gaping hole that exists in truth-telling in pictures in China from the 1950s to the 1970s. Recent documentary photograph, uh, photography, what I have elsewhere called people's photography, begins in 1976 with the brave and spontaneous records of citizens defying a government ban to gather in Tiananmen Square and mourn the death of Premier Zhou Enlai on the 4th and 5th um, of April in 1976. In the decades uh, since then, documentary photography has evolved in complex ways based on its close historical connections with both official print media organizations and therefore politics and with self-expression and art. And I thought um, I'd just uh, very briefly um, read out to you two quotations, observations by two self-taught photographers who were key members of what then became the April Photographic Society um, to help us set the scene, um, some of the tensions that we're dealing with that relate very closely to the world in which uh, Liu found himself. So the first is Wang Zhiping, who was a photographer who was writing in 1917, uh, 1979, uh, uh, and the context, of course, is after the end of the Cultural Revolution. And he, he was arguing for photography to be practiced and understood in artistic terms. And I quote him, he, said, he wrote, news photography cannot replace photographic art. Content is not the same as form. Photography as a form of art has its own special language. The beauty of photography lies in its rhythms of nature, in the realities of society, and in the emotions and interests of people. Increasingly, it, it will not have to exist in important subject matter or official ideology. So a few years later, reacting to the increasing artistic trend of photography in the work of Wang Zhiping and others, Fellow society member Li Xiaobin wrote, um, and this is a di direct contradiction to what Wang Zhiping had, had written, and he says, in my opinion, content is also form. Content and form are equally important. I strive to use the unique characteristics of photography to express the beautiful, or what is not necessarily beautiful but is real and natural, what I regard as beautiful taking spontaneous shots of people going about their daily life, I do not want to embellish them in any way. Because I do not know or understand them, the subjects, all I want to do through the forms within the, within the photograph is to convey a feeling. So here we have articulated the tension uh, that developed coming out of the Cultural Revolution era between a desire to actively shift photography away from politics and official ideology on the one hand, and a recognition of the intrinsic importance of photography to faithfully record the detail of life and the dramatic changes that were taking place as a result of China's economic reforms, so as not to have another gaping hole in the documentary photographic record. So what do we see when we look at these two documentary photographs. Petitioner on the left was taken by Li Xiaobin in 1977, and Yang Jun on the right was taken by Lu Nan in 1989. First of all, we might ask about the perspective of the photographers and their motives or purpose for taking the photographs. How does our understanding of the images change when we know about the plight of petitioners in Beijing, for example. The Chinese government estimates that there were some 30 million miscarriages of justice during the Cultural Revolution. And that Yang Jun was a patient in a mental hospital in Tianjin for 10 years, had no family, and died from tuberculosis two months after this photograph was taken. Neither of these photographs was taken by a practicing photojournalist. 
Neither of them were published or public dis publicly displayed until many years later for fear that people would misunderstand the photogra photographer's motivation for having taken them and their straightforward photographic style. In referring to Wang Zhiping, who I quoted from, and Li Xiaobin and Lu Nan, whose photographs are before you, my purpose is really to provide a larger humanistic context for understanding uh, documentary photography in China in the 1970s and 1980s. So back to Liu Hongxing and his images. And I wanted to start, and I, first of all, I apologize for the bad quality. Um, I didn't have your book with me at the time, and so some of these have been grabbed from the web. Um, so in this brief exploration of photographs from Liu's project, China After Mao, I wanted to start with this um, photograph of a billboard, a billboard version of the painting titled With You in Charge, I Am at Ease, um, painted by the military artist Peng Bin and the Central Academy of Fine Art professor Jin Chang Yi in 1977. This was the officially endorsed painting on the theme of the handover of power from Mao to his chosen successor, Hua Guofeng. And here it's displayed in a monumental form on the, on the Bund in Shanghai, photographed in, in that same year, 1977, by Liu. And in this photograph, we can see some of the hallmarks of his style. A striking, quirky image of daily life, writ large, with a strong sense of narrative and social context. And hints may be of the influence of Albanian-American action art photographer John Milley, who Leo um, mentioned earlier, um, having uh, undertaken an apprenticeship with at Life magazine, and who taught him to, and I quote, interpret human experiences and capture them in two-dimensional images with warmth. Here I want to begin just comparing Lil's um, works with um, the works of other photographers. So here we've got Lil Hongxing on the left, um, a familiar photograph taken at Democracy Wall in 1979, um, and on the right, a comparison photograph by Li Xiaobin um, taken in the same place. Um, Liu Xi Li Xiaobin worked at the Chinese Museum of History uh, um, at the time on the edge of Tiananmen Square. Um, and like Liu, he was, um, spent a lot of his time chronicling daily life, um, including the appearance of these big character posters, the outpourings of individual grievances that were posted onto the walls in a period of uh, free speech that flourished briefly in 1979. And of course, many of these posters demanded that those arrested, who had been arrested during the um, 5th of April movement in 1976, following the death of, of Zhou Enlai, be politically rehabilitated. In Liu's image on the left, um, we see an older man squatting on the ground, Chinese style, away from the action, reading the People's Daily, we're told, the official mouthpiece of the Communist Party. His solitariness provides a sense of contrast and context to the image, which in many ways is absent from Lee's image with its tight focus on the big character posters, which are large enough in the image for us to read them. And these two photographs, also very similar, or similar, similar subject matter, Lil's on the top, um, taken in 1980, um, and a related photograph by Wang Wenlan, um, titled Relaxing in the Square, taken a couple of years later in 1983. Tiananmen Square at the time was the best lit place in Beijing at night and was where students came to study for their exams, their university entrance exams, and to relax and read. In Liu's photograph, the focus is on studying and he uses the paving stones to accentuate the feeling of deep perspectival space with Mao's mausoleum and the monument to the revolutionary martyrs in the distance. By contrast, in Wang's photograph, there are more complex groupings and activities, couples and families relaxing at the end of the day and with um, the great hall of the people um, in the background. Wang Wenlan um, was very well known to, to Liu. Both were photojournalists and Wang became the head photographer of the English language uh, newspaper, China Daily, 
when it was established in 1980. And he famously remarked, having looked at Liu's photographs in China after Mao, um, that he began to realize on looking at Liu's photographs that it was possible to take photographs uh, with the mind as well as the eyes and to actively engage with history. Um, so there was a direct kind of um, sense of interaction with those photographs um, by some of the photojournalists who were actively working in Beijing. Um, of course, this image, which, um, I mean, it's hard to select from Neil's image, images. There are so many memorable ones. But, of course, um, the style brigade Yunnan from 1980, which Leo also showed us. Here I've paired with um, a photograph by Li Xiaobin, independent photographer. Um, and his title is Red Dresses Are All the Rage. And this was taken in summer in 1985. Um, both look at the changing fashions, um, both feature cool uh, sunglasses, um, but in, if we compare the two images, um, there is a, a very different um, feeling and effect created by different choices in composition, and in the case of Liu Hongqing, um, providing a greater context for his image, image of the cyclists, the female cyclists wearing what we're told are bright red dresses, um, evocative of um, their buoyant, relatively speaking, buoyant mood at this time of greater opening um, and reform. Um, and this series of images, uh, Liu's work on the left, uh, Pierre Cardin, um, in 1981, uh, putting the fi finishing touches um, or just uh, fixing the collar um, of this uh, trench coat on the male model. Um, and at the top, comparing Wang Wenlan's um, photograph, Jin Shui Bridge of 1986, uh, which is a photograph of Chinese models um, showing Northern European furs, modeling Northern European furs in front of Tiananmen. Um, and Li Xiaobin's uh, photograph below, um, which is an interior shot of an exhibition of Yves Saint Laurent's fashion held at the China um, Art Gallery in Beijing um, in 1985. Um, and interestingly, in the caption um, that accompanies Li Xiaobin's or the publication of Li Xiaobin's um, photograph, he mentioned um, how what a gulf there was in fashion sensibility and experience um, between modern Paris and modern Beijing at the time, uh, resulting in very low visitation to the exhibition, which he, of, co of course, has captured um, in this exhibition. Um, in each of the photographs, there is an interesting kind of quirky sense um, um, that, that the, photo the photographers have, have grasped on to create images that are very much of the moment. Um, I wanted to end with a photograph by He Yan Guang, um, another pioneering photojournalist um, uh, in Beijing. Uh, back in 1976, uh, he was a factory worker, imprisoned for his activities in Tiananmen Square, and after his name was cleared, he was transferred to the Central Committee of the Communist Youth League, and then became a reporter for the Beijing Youth Newspaper when it resumed publication in 1981. Um, the photograph that you see here was taken in 1980, um, and it's a companion image um, to one that he talk, took of elderly women praying in Beijing's South Cathedral um, after uh, that people were allowed to celebrate Easter once again. So a picture of Christians, um, Chinese Christians, praying um, in the South Chris, um, Church. This um, is a different image but is closely related. It's titled Second Liberation, um, and it's a group of people who are coming together after their political rehabilitation, um, after the end of the... Uh, cultural revolution. Um, it was taken with his newspaper camera but not published at the time. Um, it too is a pathos-filled work recording a historic moment for ordinary people, survivors of the cultural revolution. Um, he created two forms of this photograph which I've, I've got for you there, one cropped and one the full, for, full um, version. Um, and I just wanted to read out a quote from him that um, he wrote in 2008, looking back on over 30 years of photojournalism. Um, and he observed, and I quote, Photography is not just about looking. 
Sometimes it is also about resisting forgetfulness. People often ask me why I would take a photograph of something if it will not make it into the paper. My response is unequivocal. When you take a photograph, the image becomes eternal. You don't have to worry about waiting. The day will come when it is possible for it to be seen by readers. I have the patience to wait. History is so long. No matter what kind of prohibition there is, there is an inexorable movement towards disclosing the truth and revealing the real situation. And on this kind of, uh, in this frame, I've added um, a recent quote from He Ying, He Yang Wang written last year on the 1st of July, which happens to be the anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and it was written following his visit to, with, together with Wang Wenlan to a graduation exhibition at the Xi'an Technology University Photography Department. Um, and basically it reads, um, art is art or art photography, is implying is complex, uh, representation is easy or expression is easy, which is perhaps, a canny, which is perhaps canny advice uh, from an old pro, uh, particularly in the context of official media organizations in China which remain heavily politicized. So to conclude, one of Liu's most memorable and uh, reproduced um, photographs is this one, uh, Skating Past Mao, taken at the Dalian Institute of Technical Management um, in 1981. Liu's double portrait juxtaposes the living and the dead. The anonymous skater glides past a giant statue of Mao, propelling himself forward through the space, through space that appears boundless as the sky in an action of apparent fearlessness, as if he has broken free. Liu Hongxing's background as an outsider, and by that I mean a photojournalist then working for Time magazine, and an insider with a contextual understanding, gave him a unique position as a photojournalist in China. He has created for us a rich legacy of striking images that are imbued with humanistic feeling and a great sense of the historical moment. Like the work of many fine photographers, they defy easy categorization, drawing on the stuff of daily life to create images that are at once documentary and artistic in their ambition. China After Mao is an important body of work that contributes to the history of Chinese visual culture. Thank you.